Today is a distinguished lecture by Shafi Goldwasser. I'm very, very excited to welcome Shafi to come to UW to give this distinguished lecture. And I think Shafi really needs no introduction. She is the founding mother of modern cryptography and has made so many contributions to computer science in general. And for that, she has been awarded an impressive list of awards, including the 2012 Turing Award. She's currently the director of Simons Institute for Theory of Computing and holds professor positions at UC Berkeley, MIT, and the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. Shafi has been a true force of nature throughout her career and has always been very creative and fearless in her research. And uh, I was a, as a fellow cryptographer and also Shafi's past the postdoc, I really witnessed this in close distance and admire her work on interactive proofs, zero knowledge proofs and public key encryption. So now she has the venture to see how cryptographic tools and the cryptographic thinking might help other fields like machine learning as they become more and more critical in our modern lives. So let's hear Shafi. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I've been before, but uh, this time it's virtual. Uh, but I enjoyed meeting people throughout the day. And uh, if you want to ask questions, just raise your voice and ask them or put them in the chat, whatever you like. So the title of my talk is, uh, I'm not sure which one I gave as a title exactly, but it's the same topic. It's Safe Machine Learning and an alternative title is how can we use more mathematics to address the growing uh, distrust in algorithms. So I guess I'll start with some kind of a motivational story. And that is, uh, people probably know there was this Proposition 25 that was considered in California about replacing cash bail with risk assessment tools. So this thing passed in the legislature in 2018, and then it was up for uh, a vote, sort of a referendum. A, and uh, people were, uh, this is what was on the ballot. And it was to change uh, cash bail, uh, that is to end it and to replace it uh, with uh, a, you know, machine learning system or risk assessment system, which will use uh, statistical evidence to determine if a suspect should release or be released on bail or not without paying any money. And uh, so this was up for a vote and it did not pass. And uh, it's kind of interesting to read why it did not pass. So obviously the supporter of this said that cash bail system is inherently racist, classist, which it is, you have to have money uh, in order to be able to be released on, on, on bail. And people with generational health can uh, pay their way out of jail while awaiting trials or others cannot. Uh, so it's clearly you know, unfair. Of course, the, um, uh, the opponents were made of two types. First of all, with the bail bond industry, they were gonna lose a lot of money if their cash bail uh, was out the window. But interestingly, uh, the more interesting point, which is relevant to this talk, is that a lot of people that were against it were actually civil rights advocates. So they said, well, cash bail is fundamentally flawed. We all agree with that. But while algorithms, so cash bail meaning that you have to pay money depending on your, whatever the judge says, in order to be released on bail. So they said, yes, cash bail is fundamentally flawed, but while algorithms can pitch you a song, I'm just reading from something on the internet, or sell a toaster, they shouldn't be used for release action decisions. The factors considered for release will still lead people of color being held for trial at disproportionate rates. So Proposition 25 is further from the existing problem, but no closer to the solution. In other words, they liked the idea of ending cash bail and to go to bail no bail decisions, but they didn't like the idea that there will be some, uh, you know, risk assessment, automatic risk assessment tool that will let, will advise the judge whether you should release someone bail or not. And, um, you know, sort of the unintended consequences of not trusting the, the system is that they remained with cash bail, but uh, system. So it, it wasn't surprising to me because uh, we had a, a, a program at the Institute a, in 2019, it, about uh, this whole question of fairness and privacy. And there was a, a workshop called Wrong at the Root, Racial Bias and the Tension Between Numbers and Words in a Non-Internet Data. And most of the people who participated were, or it was like this, 50% computer scientists who were working on trying to make algorithms more fair according to some definition. 
less bias, if we want to use that word. And the other half were people really from social science and law who were very distrustful of whatever it is the computer scientists were trying to do. And it wasn't so much that they were distrustful of computer science as such, but uh, the whole effort of uh, trying to say that algorithms can be made fair according to whatever uh, was their understanding was they completely didn't believe it. A, so for example, here is uh, one of the things that was written after at, during this workshop saying the pervasive use of algorithmic risk assessment complicates a, and undermines many bedrock democratic values, institutional um, you know, standards of accountability, constitutional principles, and they're saying who or what determines our fitness for inclusion within a newly constituted technological community. So now the technological community all of a sudden are going to, are going to decide uh, that the algorithms are fair, maybe they'll improve, maybe they won't improve, but this is not really up to the standard that we have developed over years or up to the scrutiny. Um, so they don't believe that risk factors uh, as governed by probabilistic modeling will capture what uh, has been achieved, let's say over the years for let's say underrepresented groups. And uh, the operative word that they use was ungoverned data driven assessments are creating a new form of stigma, disparate impact and group discrimination. So what do they mean by ungoverned? So since this is really was written by lawyers, um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, definition that somebody gave, this is Martha Minna from the law school at Harvard, is what does she mean by governance? You know, what does she mean by governance in general? And she says participatory, responsive, inclusive, follows the rule of law, accurate and efficient. And the argument that they were making, the lawyers, was that algorithms might be accurate and efficient, but they don't, but they don't include all these other governance uh, principles. So, uh, you know, of course, when they mean algorithms, they don't mean, you know, running a, a you know, a, a breath for a search algorithm, but they mean machine learning. I just want to make sure that we all agree with that. So I'm not a lawyer and I don't necessarily share the sentiment that uh, anything that technologists do uh, has no chance of succeeding. But I got to say that a, as a CS person, I, I am, I think we should be concerned about a whole array of things, which maybe is a formaliz formalism to this intuitive idea that uh, algorithms should be governed. So here's a list of things that as a CS person, I would be concerned about. And several of the works that I'll talk about essentially fall square into this uh, kind of roadmap. So for example, during the development of the algorithm, I broke it into sort of three categories. During the time you develop the algorithm, after you develop it, and uh, even assuming that all these two stages were done properly, what about the fact that you're gonna get future distributions which were not the distributions that you trained your algorithm on. So the, the first stage is uh, you are developing the, the ML algorithm. Uh, do you really have access to properly labeled data? Do you have enough properly labeled data? Um, or you might ask questions like, where does, um, it, you know, if you're using randomness as they do often, let's say in neural net training, a, where's randomness coming from? And what do you know about this randomness and how the selection of randomness may uh, affect uh, you know, the quality of the algorithm. Uh, post, these are just sample questions. You may ask a lot of other questions. You know, post-development, one question that I uh, worked on and I'm concerned with is, okay, somebody developed it. Who's gonna verify that the ML code that comes up is actually correct in this? And, and, and when you ask that question, you realize it's not clear what you mean by correct. Because it's not like there's a specification of a function and now you wanna make sure that the, that the algorithm that's been developed actually computes the function, right? It's a data-driven uh, um, function. And what does it mean that the algorithm is accurate then? Uh, here, you can ask lots of questions. You, first of all, in a formal sense, what does it mean that you verify a machine learning algorithm? And then you can uh, talk about with a verifier, when you're verifying it, what do you have access to? Do you have open source access to the algorithm? Do you have access to historical data that you can check against? So uh, I'll spend some of my talk talking about that. And the last part, is, as I said, suppose that you developed it with access to good, well, a, 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 an abundant amount of labeled uh, data, properly labeled data. And suppose that you verified that the code that people claim that they trained is the code that's being uh, produced. Then uh, what happens if now you have a, a total shift in population? 
So the people, let's say in the context, for example, of Proposition 25, the people who are being considered for bail or not bail, they're completely different than the ones that the algorithm was trained on. Um, a, how well does your algorithm generalize? How well does it address future distributions, both naively uh, different distribution, like shift distribution, or uh, maybe uh, even adversarial distribution? And I know that this is a topic that a lot of people in, in U of W work on. And of course, there's a question of fairness. So that's my plan, is to talk about these things in random order, <laughs> but not really. Uh, I'm gonna first talk about verification, then I show you some work that I, I've done um, on uh, future distributions versus training distribution. And actually at the end, I will talk about this first, uh, this first question is a, what do we do when we don't have access to enough properly labeled data? And what do we do when we, uh, is randomness really a problem? Is the fact that you allow the, the, the learner to, to sample randomness as they wish, can that really bring problems? So I've worked on multiple aspects here and I, uh, I'm just gonna give you a lot of uh, results in some sense and explain why I thought it would be interesting to work on them and a little bit of the technique, but it's not like one topic that I'm gonna do a deep dive to. Any questions? No, all right, so that's the plan. So first of all, we're talking about verification, right? And I guess, um, you know, there's some lessons to be to learn about the question of verification or why you want verification from electronic voting. Uh, so you probably are familiar with some stories about electronic voting that uh, already at this point, many years ago, like 2008, there was this county in California where they discovered by chance, this is a quote from that time, that the tabulation software uh, dropped um, some uh, votes from the total. And then the conclusion that was uh, drawn was that, wait a second, we have to you know, resort to older voting technology because we can't tell whether these machines actually do things properly, whether they count properly, whether they drop votes. Um, and the lesson was really that you cannot trust the physical machines, okay? A, and what you need is a verification mechanism. So it could be that um, the machine is always gonna fail. You can never trust it. But what you want is to be able to detect that it fails. And I think they, there's this uh, principle even that I think Revest and, and WAC came up with, which was saying that a voting system uh, should be software independent. If, um, if there is an error that you cannot cause a, an undetectable a change in an election outcome. So in other words, the, there's an independence from the machine that's sort of counting the votes and the machine that is, is verifying. So there's two different and they're independent of each other. So uh, I think a lot of the literature now suggests that there should be some paper trace. I'm not sure why. I think we have a lot of cryptographic tools that can address uh, this, not with paper, but you know, using sort of encryptions or knowledge proofs and, and things of that sort. But what does that have to do with my, um, with, my, with my plan for this talk? It has to do with the realization that maybe we cannot fix learning algorithms, but we have to add to them or risk assessment system. But, you know, in the California case, suppose it was one company who coming up with a risk assessment tool, and now every court in California was using it for bail decisions. You know, what would be, would be a problem is if they did the wrong thing. But so you absolutely need another independent verifier of that code. And now the question is, how do you verify? What does it mean to verify? So we have a lot of tools in theory computation for verifying program correctness. You know, there's program correctness and checking, interactive proofs, you're not proofs, non-interactive proofs, a lot of stuff out there, but all of it is for when you are actually checking the program for correctness for pre-specified function, where in a um, machine learning case, you know, the key question is that there's an unknown uh, ground truth. We just don't know it. So how are we gonna check that the, you know, risk assessment system computes F? What are we even supposed to verify? So the first contribution is that we're gonna give a, a definition. And I, it will be uh, a little bit modeled after uh, Valiant's um, definition for learning. So, you know, there's a definition from 1984 in this article, A Theory of the Learnable, where he says you're given some labeled examples, X and this should be F of X of a concept. You know, it goes from X to zero one, let's say, the so decision, yes or no, this could be more general doesn't have to be two decisions. It might even be 
um, x to some probability of, of a decision, a confidence interval. But let's just see in the simplest form. You're given an x, which is a feature vector, and f gets given the feature vector decides yes or no. Bail, no bail, give you a loan, doesn't give you a loan, accepts you to school, doesn't accept you to school, and so forth. And it's all drawn according to some distribution d. And uh, Valiant defines a pack learning algorithm with two parameters is uh, an algorithm that generates some hypothesis H. So that's a, a, a proxy for F. And he says it's a good learning algorithm if it agrees with F, you know, approximately with high probability on inputs drawn from the same distribution that you learned from. So in other words, the probability that your H disagrees is small. And that's true with high probability. Whenever X is sampled according to the examples that you saw. So that's the canonical uh, learning definition in learning theory. And what we'd like to do now is to say, well, there's not just a learner, but when we want to verify uh, a pack model, there's also a verifier. And we want to think of it this way. Both of them can sample the distribution, you know, the X and F of X, that's the label distribution. Um, and this guy first, goes first, learns some hypothesis, maybe sends it along to the verifier, and now they can go back and forth at the end of which the verifier says, I accept your hypothesis or I reject. And in a minute, I'll say, what are the you know, conditions that we want on this acceptance and rejection? And this is joint work with Jonathan Schaefer, a student of mine, a Guy Rothblum, and Emilio Dayov. And they were all visiting at Simons at the time. So one thing I want to say is to make this interesting, we don't want the verifier to work as much as the learner did. Because after all, the, you, know, you can think of the verifier it just learns by itself and checks what he got against what the, uh, uh, the verifier can do the same amount of work. And then it's kind of stupid. I mean, first you want the learner to do a lot of work and you want to be able to verify this with less resources. And when I say less resources, maybe less samples from the distribution that were required for learning, maybe even different quality uh, samples. So maybe this guy can have membership queries, like he can give an X and get back a label of X, like an F of X. So you can think of this as, you know, in the context of a trial, you could have some attributes and see how a judge would, would uh, rule on that. Or in a medical situation, you would take a patient of a certain um, attributes, you give them a medication and you see whether the medication helped. Whereas the verifier doesn't enjoy this type of privilege necessarily, he can just randomly sample. This might be a, a type of difference between the prover and the verifier. And what we'd like to do is, now this is really a handful or a screenful, uh, but it's one of the most densest slides in this talk and I'll walk you through it. You don't have to really read it carefully, okay? So I wanna com come up with a definition. Before it was pack learnable, now it's pack verification, pack verifiable. And I'm saying a class of hypotheses H um, is class verifiable, yeah, sorry, is pack verifiable. If the following is true, um, there exists some verifier. Uh, so if you want to think about what are this class of hypothesis, you want to, let's think of decision trees, okay? And we want to ask whether they're pack verifiable, okay? You can uh, learn uh, a good, you could well, you could verify a decision tree uh, learning algorithm. It could be a neural net. Uh, if there exists a verifier such for L, epsilon delta and for every distribution, the following is true. So first of all, for, Remember our verifier, sorry, our learner, he comes up with some hypothesis, H. And we're gonna say that every hypothesis is a loss. What's the loss? It's uh, when it's incorrect with respect to the label that should be there. So whereas before these Ys were given by F, forget the F, there is every X has a label Y, that's the correct label Y. And when the learner outputs a hypothesis, either it agrees with the right Y or not. <clears throat> and let's think about the best hypothesis, H prime. So it's the one that makes the least number of mistakes and is still in the class. So the best decision tree to learn account, uh, labels, okay? And what I want to say is that I can verify this H prime. So a learner gives me an H, okay? And I want to verify that it's a good H. I'm actually going to be checking how close it is to the best possible. So he's giving me a decision tree, say, for deciding bail, and I want, you know, the decision tree might say, what is the sex of the person, the age, whatever, I don't know, whatever they're doing. Um, I wanna know whether what I got is the, as close, you know, it's pretty close to the best that can be done. And I have access as a verifier to the distribution, you know, to X and Y pairs that came from the distribution. And we want to be true for the system of, of learner and verifier 
three things, completeness, soundness, and efficiency. Completeness would mean is the prover can actually convince me. If he sends me a hypothesis, which is pretty close to the optimal hypothesis. So in other words, the loss, the number, amount of mistakes that I make with what he sent me is pretty close to this best that can be done. That's completeness. So it's possible to actually um, find a close hypothesis to the best one. Soundness means, uh, and in that case, uh, the verifier will accept. So the verifier can recognize that. Soundness means that regardless of what the prover does and how tricky he is in coming up with an hypothesis, um, you know, uh, H, then the probability that I will accept it if the loss is large, so it's much further away from the best decision tree, say, or the best uh, loss that can be obtained by the type of hypothesis that I'm considering, then I will reject. So the probability that I accept is small. So in other words, if they send me a good, they did training faithfully and, um, and it's close to optimal, I will accept. If it's far from optimal, I will reject. And furthermore, double efficiency is kind of vaguely defined here as we want both of them not to be, you know, to use exponential number of queries or exponential amount of time, uh, but the verify is more efficient. Uh, now, since this is sort of an opening of a field, or, or not of a field, but a, a concept, we introduce this concept, more efficient is sort of a working, is, is a target, how do you say it, um, a moving target. It could be more efficient, it could be that one is n squared and the other one is n number of samples. It could be that uh, it's two to the n versus n. Uh, it could be that you always want the verify to be linear. Any result I think would be interesting here to begin with, depending on how interesting is the hypothesis class. Okay, so too many letters, but the big picture is the learner can convince a verifier to accept when he should. The learner should not convince the verifier to accept when he shouldn't. And the verifier's job shouldn't be very difficult. Okay, so, uh, and what's the picture in our mind? The verifier might be just outsourcing this machine learning task to someone. They have time, they have access to samples, they collect a lot of data, they train a model and they send it back. And now the verifier receives the model and he can sample and check to see whether it has good ac accuracy, right? So he's taking from the sample X labeled Xs and he can check whether the model accepts them or accordingly or rejects them correctly. And let's say it's, it has 80% accuracy. Should he accept or shouldn't he accept? depend uh, if we want it to be consistent with our definition. So the realization is that if indeed this hypothesis, it, it, you know, the, the ground truth, there is a decision tree that is perfect. So it, 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 it really completely fits the data. I guess that's what's called in um, uh, proper learning, I think, so, um, is it? Or is there a realizable case? Realizable case, where there is a realizable case. <laughs> Jamie, thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, then um, it's not a very difficult problem. Really, you just sample, take uh, one of our epsilon random samples, accept if everything's classified correctly. And uh, if there's a zero loss, you'll always accept. If the loss is larger than epsilon or, or the hypothesis that you receive, you should reject. And uh, really verification and learning are fairly close to each other. So the interesting case is when it's not realized. So in other words, the ground truth is not captured by a decision tree in the example we were talking about, okay? But the learner learned the decision tree and gave it to me. So there will be mistakes there. So what is it that I want to achieve though? I want to achieve that, that whatever they sent me, okay, is not too far from the optimal. Now what they sent me, I can estimate what the loss is with respect to the training set, but I don't know how to, I don't know what the optimal is. And yet I want to be able, the prover to prove to me this equation that in other words, that the optimal is large compared to what the hypothesis that it received. And this is where the challenge comes in. In the case where, um, you know, the, the ground truth actually is not captured in this hypothesis class. All right. So the question that we set out to ask in this work is can verifying be cheaper than learning? And um, as I said before, and the results that we get and again, we'll skim through them quickly because I want to get to the next topic is first of all, lower bound, and that is not always. So there exists some sequence of classes which you could sort of engineer. So they're not very interesting necessarily. Classes, these are not decision trees, 
but some uh, classes of hypothesis where you really need as much as many samples to verify as you do random samples to verify as you do to learn. There's not a big difference. And the idea really is you choose these hypothesis classes you know, randomly. There's no uh, inherent um, structure there. The second thing you can show is sometimes there, it can, you can actually prove that there's a difference. Again, these are these threshold, um, so they're more interesting. They're not just random hypothesis classes. It's when you have uh, a bunch of thresholds that you're supposed to learn. So there's a sequence of these where um, you know, uh, verifying is possible with square root of the uh, number of samples that learning requires. Um, and uh, both the prover and the verifier are sort of efficient in, in this um, D, which is the VC dimension, but the verifier can do it even more efficiently. But I think the most interesting result in this sequence, so really just to remember is sometimes verifying is as expensive Sometimes it can be cheaper, let's say by a square root, by a polynomial difference. But I think the most interesting question is uh, if you look at, at the type of data access. So here we look at a class of um, hypothesis, which is more the kind of hypothesis people have considered. And that is suppose that your hypothesis is a function. So what the prover sends to the verifier or what the learner sends to the verifier is a, a sparse representation in the Fourier basis um, of a function, and, um, and he says here, this is a, this is my uh, how I represent my hypothesis, and uh, it turns out that if you look at these type of hypotheses, then they're not learnable from random samples. So we know this from learning theory that unless learning parity with noise, which is a hard problem, is is, is tractable, uh, unless it's not intractable, um, then. Uh, uh, you just can't learn it from random examples. So if you wanted to learn the, co the Fourier coefficients of such functions, you would have to ask membership queries. So you'd have to give an X and get back uh, the label for X and, and so forth, okay? And if you are able to choose X uh, as to your liking, then you're able to approximate these uh, Fourier, a, a Fourier coefficients. And in fact, this is kind of in a similar, this class, you can think of it as decision trees. And uh, that's why I was using the example of decision trees before. But what we can show is that you could actually verify this class using access to random samples. So whereas to learn, you need membership queries, to verify, you just need random samples, which is kind of interesting because these are qualitatively different, uh, you know, a access to the, to the distribution. And uh, uh, they both run actually in the same run of time. So they both will have, um, you know, will, will, will be polynomial in one over delta, one over epsilon, and t, which is the number of, um, a number of non-zero coefficients in, in the function representation. And here is the length of the feature vector x. Um, so this is the result, which I think is interesting. I think there's a lot of interesting questions here. I'll enumerate some of them, but one of them is to take uh, an hypothesis class that you're interested in, whether it's link, link, linear regression. We've done some work on that, trying to do linear regression or logistic regression, and to see whether you can verify the results faster than, than you can, um, or with less queries, then you can uh, find, let's say, the regression formula. And uh, so far, we have not been able to uh, find the gap it's because these regression uh, techniques are quite good. So verifying um, doesn't, there's no, at least we haven't found a way to verify better than the regression. But the, of course there are different measures that you can look at. It could be query complexity, it could be time, it could be space, um, and it could be the type of access. And another type of access, which I think would be interesting to look at is that the prover might have access to more accurate data so where the labels are correct with higher probability than the verifier does. And uh, in that case, it's, it would be interesting to see that even if your data set is labeled not so well, that whether you can verify uh, with less uh, pow power in that sense, that you have more errors. Okay, so I started with that example about Proposition 25. And what if I came back to the state of uh, California <laughs> and said, listen, don't worry about it. Uh, now you can run the proposition again because we have ways to verify those risk assessment 
the tools that, uh, that people are going to invent for bail, no bail decisions. Does it, so besides the fact that this is not no more fair than the other ones, if that was what was concerning the civil rights advocates, it's not even clear when you talk to legal experts, how would they accept um, you know, statistics and probability in legal setting? So that's sort of another uh, very interesting question. You know, we are using these uh, risk assessment tools. We are sort of thinking of them as the uh, ultimate uh, gold, uh, golden goose. But if you are thinking about a setting like putting someone in jail or uh, or releasing them, it's not clear that saying statistical things like, well, with high probability, uh, this person is not guilty. If we take it to the courtroom, not to the bail decision, with how that will be. Uh, viewed as a nice paper called Statistics in, in, uh, in the Court, Incorrect Probabilities, where they go through a whole bunch of cases in the past where essentially they were using the law of probabilities incorrectly. So they were thinking the probabilities were independent of each other, where they were clearly dependent. So they were, and, and so, instead, so when they were saying that something is very unlikely to happen, they were multiplying these probabilities uh, as if they were independent and getting very, very, very small probabilities, something couldn't have happened by chance. There must have been, you know, a bad actor, um, and this happens at, at time and again, uh, sort of an incorrect use of the product rule for the probabilities. So it's unclear whether this whole research will have bearing in the legal setting, okay? Just because of a much more fundamental question, which is, is how will statistics be viewed in, in the courts? So I'm kind of switching gears now. We talked about verification of machine learning algorithms. And then, and my next thing is to say, wait a second, uh, in a legal setting where we're gonna to have to argue, for example, in the case of bail or in the case of somebody not getting a loan, and they're gonna argue and say, you're, you're, uh, the bank will say, well, my machine learning algorithm uh, said that I shouldn't give you a loan because with high probability you are uh, high risk. How is that gonna stand up in court? I think it's a very interesting question or you didn't get accepted to school. So I know now uh, at Simons, we have a semester on causality and they keep talking about the cases of the Harvard uh, case on accept admission or about whether it was uh, racist or not racist. And they talk about this counterfactual. What if you had the same profile with a different uh, ethnicity? What would be the acceptance rate? And uh, they're using statistics there really to argue whether they're whether Harvard is okay or Harvard is not okay. And it's not very unclear whether that's how courts should make decisions, but apparently uh, it's kind of slipping through the door. James? Shafi, yeah. Uh, you said it's unclear if that's how this court should, uh, courts should make decisions or whether, or whether that's how they do make decisions. I even think it's unclear whether they should make decisions this way because you want to make absolutely sure they're using probability theory correctly. Even if we believe that statistics should be grounds for, for uh, deciding whether a particular place is discriminating or not, who, I, 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 this slide worries me. Like who's advising them? Is it that the, you know, the expert for the defense versus the expert for the prosecution is, uh, are, try, are using unnecessarily experts mathematically and the arguments that they make can be actually understood by a judge and jury. Th that's what worries me. But this seems to me like dismissing the use of logic in courtrooms because humans are logical, which doesn't seem. No, I, I, I don't, I don't, okay. Well taken. In fact, a, you know, I'm sort of play, playing the opposite uh, position that I played in in a seminar that I was two days ago, when they talked about the discrimination case for Harvard, and someone was arguing about against statistics and stuff, and I was like, "Well, then, you know, you're saying that I could never uh, argue anything in a quantified fashion. You know, there's no, as you say, logic." Um, I just am cautioning <laughs> whether the courts will do it correctly, one, and uh, whether we should trust them in that case, to do it correctly. I'm just saying it's a, it's a topic to think about. I'm not taking a position. But then, it, but then it's the case that you should probably say, right, that we should only use bounded depth circuits in order to convince like juries of things because we can't expect the jury to understand the more complicated argument than of a certain form. No, it just seems like a question that comes up before probabilities are involved. That's actually a very interesting point. 
Well, what do you think about it? Should we just use bounded depth circuits to convince Teresa or finite state automata? I don't know how much they can, uh, or, or, and typical Joy or me absorb in a courtroom. My guess is that uh, any any successful argument made by made by an attorney <laughs> could be represented as like a bounded depth circuit, uh, right? So so in the case of trying to convince a jury of something, right? It's you can make as complicated of, a, of an argument as you want, but it's not clear that that will be uh, a successful a successful endeavor, right? Uh, statistics, it seems only more complicated because you don't need very many quantifiers, ands, ors, and nots before you end up in like Simpson paradox land, right? Where you can really be misleading people uh, depending upon how you partition your data set. Interesting. Anyway, let's continue. The, but I think it's a fundamental question. You know, if we are trying to talk about our impact on, uh, on things like uh, decisions that are happening in the real world, uh, it's, it's, it's important to, to try to understand who is the arbitrator. Right, and what are the type of arguments that they would be willing to accept? Uh, otherwise, it's kind of a uh, wild west. I mean, I'm living in the wild west now, at least in the west. So, like, we come up with the algorithms, we like them, people accept it. So, it's something to pay attention to. So, another issue is um, is uh, whether you remember I had this uh, learner and verifier, and uh, both of them were accessing. Um, it had the hypothesis in their hands. In all the results that we use, they access the hypothesis in a black box manner. And uh, that could be something that it just was good enough for us. It could be that you could get more interesting results if it wasn't in, in black box manner. On the other hand, again, if you think about the applications we're talking about, even in the, the California thing with the Proposition 25, they were going to put a lot of money into companies that will build the software and a lot of money into companies that will verify the software. And they were agreeing that the verifiers wouldn't look inside the software. They would just be able to use it in an input output fashion. Um, so again, there you could ask, how would legal scholars view this? Decoupling you know, this idea that you're verifying from knowing, um, you know, from looking at the insides, just from input output uh, behavior. So we went, um, so I actually, that's another uh, piece of work that I wanted to, to just mention is that I have uh, been talking to kind of uh, people in the law school here at Berkeley to ask them how would these questions, how, how do they think legal scholars would view this idea that you can't look inside of the box or that you um, use statistics. And uh, they seem to be uh, more receptive than, uh, than I thought. And they claim that, for example, using things like uh, black box and making conclusions based on that. Um, might, uh, you know, and then, then extending it actually in the, to, to using uh, zero knowledge arguments where someone like the prover is proving to the, to the verifier, say, or the learner is proving to the verifier statements in zero knowledge might be something that lawyers would, would actually be welcome because they were claiming that the law beyond this machine learning setting is full of uh, trust problems, which involve uh, digital information. A, it's full of cases where you have one party that tries to argue a fact and another part, and in order to argue it has to disclose a lot of information about what they're arguing and another party that has to verify it. And they were saying that there are a lot of legal doctrines which actually don't work because whenever there is this dilemma of what, the disclosure benefit outweighing the disclosure risk, people just you know drop the case. So if the benefit is that um, that uh, you're going to win your court case, but the risk is that you've given a lot of information that may risk your uh, your future business. Say, then it's it's not worth it. So rather than talk in abstractions, you think about deal making. The, you have a company. You want to go beyond the, the the scope of the company in order to merge to another company, or to buy them, or to sell. Uh, there is this paradox by Arrow from '62, called the paradox of information disclosure, where he essentially shows that going beyond the boundary of the firm is a dangerous thing in many many situations. And in which case, you cannot, in some sense, you want to increase your economic uh, welfare by going outside of the boundary but you have a risk of decreasing it because you're going to lose information. And uh, I think that crypto technology can come to bear on these things. We're enabling to verify certain facts about digital information without revealing the entire set of data. And maybe this will enable us to get out of this paradox. 
Um, in trade secret law, it's a, you know, if there's like two companies, one claims they invented something, they, some code or that, and that somebody stole it from them and they have to go in front of a judge. In order to go in front of a judge, you have to expose your, your code. But that's exactly what you were worried about to begin with, that somebody's stealing your code. How do you, how do you do that? How do you prove that two pieces of code are close to each other without actually revealing them? Again, you know, it's sort of cryptographically a simple problem, right? You could sort of commit to both of them and, or encrypt both of them and perform whatever ch check needs to be done under the hood, kind of under encryption. Um, so in any case, it, you know, sort of coming out of this, how do we deal with courts and technology? You know, there's on the one hand a worry like in the previous case, that they won't accept our new thinking. On the other hand, there seems to be reception to tools that have been developed you know, in crypto, I'm sure in other fields as well, in order to uh, kind of get out of situations which they didn't know how to handle before. Um, so there's a bunch of areas where that's the case. And I think that there even is a case to make that it's not gonna just make law more efficient, like more faster processing of cases in a courtroom, but it might make it sort of more nimble, you know, more expressive, more precise, when you can, can trade off the verification and exposure. So you want to verify something, does it mean that you need to expose uh, everything about your own data sets, about your own company, about your own trade secret? And it doesn't it seem to be the case, at least in theory. Here's the challenge is to go from theory to practice. Like one thing is to say that, you know, NP is in zero knowledge and you can just, and another thing is to, and somebody's claimed that digital information corresponds to the truth, right? So there's some sort of how do you ground, a company claims that they have assets. How do I know if they have assets? You know, they encrypt sort of the record of their assets, but maybe those don't correspond to real assets in the world. And then even if they, they did, you know, our theory is fairly heavy. And if you wanted to, you know, code it up, you need to, to think, um, you know, in a much more practical way. Remember, I was talking about the design of the system, and I we just talked about verification and somehow went into the legal domain for a few minutes. Now, uh, what about um, this question that the, that the, the um, whoever designs the learner, uh, the, al the learning algorithm it uses randomness, okay? Is that uh, something that should worry us? Could it be that the source of randomness they use is very skewed and is that going to ruin the, um, the, the quality of the learning algorithm? So when I, 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 when I was still in Boston and I, I, I brought this up with a bunch of my learning colleagues, they were saying, well, it doesn't really matter which, which um, sort of random number generator you're using, um, it works just as well. So there, you don't need anything that's truly random or unpredictable. So then we have this work that I understand that Michael Kim gave a talk in uh, UW a few months ago or something on that. So this is with Michael Kim and Vinod and uh, Oza Mil, uh, which was, well, that's true, but if you don't trust the learner, okay, to use good randomness, it's not just that they want to be accurate. Maybe they are a malicious entity. Maybe the learner is putting, using uh, random weights, okay, on a, like say in a neural net setting, so that they are able to, to fool you, fool you in the following sense that uh, the network seems great. It seems uh, um, indistinguishable. This is what I define here, indistinguishable from another network that was, was really using random samples without doctoring the randomness. Uh, but there's a trapdoor in it. Trapdoor meaning that um, if uh, I'm designing a network, a neural net, and I chose the randomness in such a way a, I could tell my friends uh, how to do change their input slightly so that they can get a favorable outcome. So you can imagine that in the setting of a, of a loan or many other settings where uh, the people in charge of uh, designing the system can make it so that they know how to change the inputs ever so slightly in a way that nobody could detect that, but you would change the outcome to their friends. Um, so randomness is important. Um, so we have some results about how the, you can actually transform any machine learning algorithm into one which is backdoored if you assume the digital signatures exist. And, um, and then if a, another one is given a specific, this random ferry feature um, learning algorithm of uh, where we can take this and change it into a, an equivalent network, equivalent in the sense that if you it's trained on the same data, you're not poisoning the data or anything, you're just changing the weights 
so that you could have a back door that could uh, allow the one who knows the back door to generate, to change the feature vector to get a, a, a favorable uh, outcome. Okay, and it's based again on this um, problem from cryptography, the continuous LWE problem. If it's hard, then it will be undetectable. All right, so I want to move on to this part, which I think is probably all I'm going to manage to do at this point. Um, and that is, okay, we verified, we um, maybe we chose the randomness correctly. And now our algorithm is out there in the field. Uh, it was verified wonderfully with respect to past data. What about future data? So this is a work with, uh, Yael and Adam Kalai and uh, Omar Montesar from the uh, University of, uh, uh, from Toyota Institute. It's gonna say University of Chicago. It's just the same geographic location. And it's learning guarantees with arbitrary adversarial examples. All right, so what is this about? So back to the Valiant thing. This is just the same slide that I had in the beginning, pack learning. And I just wanna pay attention to something. And that is that the distribution that I learned with, that I got the training examples from, let's call it D here, was the same distribution as what I was tested on. So Valiant said, look, if you're trained on distribution D, you should learn on distribution. You should be able to predict on distribution D with small error with high probability. But, um, you know, and this is just, I, I'm gonna use learning half spaces throughout the talk. So uh, I'm gonna think about a, an example where a line uh, separates pluses from minuses. Plus will be positive training, minus negative training. And then the test examples are these little round dots. Um, and let's say the true function is F and I learned H. Here I'm talking actually uh, the, the realizable situation. There is a line that separates plus from minus. And the learning algorithm learned H and with respect to the pluses and minuses that you've seen, it's, it's perfect. Um, and that's what a Valiant uh, requested. But uh, I think that nobody should say at the University of Washington because you have some of the people who came up with this whole thing, this problem. but. The training distribution and the testing distribution are not necessarily going to be the same, could be just naively so, not even adversarial. So one example here is uh, sort of lung, uh, doing a lung MRIs or, or x-rays for people who've had COVID, people who haven't had COVID. So let's say it was trained on normal and then it was tested on, on uh, you know, 2022. And uh, similar like the, you know, the US data normals versus international normals. They looked at, maybe you were trained here, but then you're tested over here. So there are these natural shifts which do not obey Valiant's assumption that the training data and the testing data are the same. And furthermore, even if it, it worse, if an adversary is the one who chooses the test data, then really we are sunk. So uh, I guess the current approaches in ML is to define a class of domain specific attacks, improve robustness via robust training. Uh, and often that's called like in the image setting, there's a perturbation of the image, there's a set of perturbation that's allowed and you're gonna make your algorithm robust against people who are doing those type of perturbations. However, not everything is restricted to what you think it is. And I guess, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of papers about the pandas and the, airplanes and these weird things where you stick some barcode, which is not a natural perturbation, and then a panda looks like a plane or something like that. So the crypto, um, the crypto, so there's an adversary who does that. So the crypto goal, you know, thinking of the cryptographer again, is that you want this to be safe to use the machine learning algorithm for any adversarial strategy, not just perturbations, not just the class of, of adversaries, maybe computationally bounded. However, um, and this is the work that we did. However, it's pretty clear that uh, that's an impossible goal. So in other words, here in this picture, if all the pluses are here and the minuses are here, this is what I was trained on. And then at test time, this comes in. How the heck am I gonna know how to distinguish F1 ground truth from F2 ground truth? Can't, I've never seen it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the definition of what we're requiring from the, classifier. So first thing we're going to say is that he doesn't just have to label things as plus and minuses for these black dots, but he can also abstain. He could say yes, plus, no, minus, or I don't know. I have, I have no idea. So he can abstain. And that's actually not going to be enough because if we want to actually look at cases of white, uh, sort of like an adversary who actually even knows my hypothesis. So he knows what I'm working at, 
accordingly. And if he knows my hypothesis, he's gonna do everything in his power to make me make mistakes. He's just gonna put it slightly uh, uh, next to, let's say, uh, the border and make it so that I make lots of errors. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we're gonna let the learner first abstain and second, we're gonna let him have some access to unlabeled test example. So the story now is like this, in this new, in the new requirements. So there's a new notion, uh, which we call PQ learning. So whereas valiance thing was just, there was one distribution, I called it D before, but let's think of it as P, this slide. So you test, your, your training distribution was P, but the test distribution is gonna be Q and P and Q may not be the same. And what we're saying is, okay, now you're given some uh, X's, some X, uh, feature vectors and a label according to some function and uh, from a training distribution. And now I'm gonna give you in addition a whole bunch of um, um, testing distributions, sorry. This should say, uh, then I was gonna define a PQ learner as the following. Uh, it, the same as invalidance thing, he has to output a hypothesis, okay? Uh, but he also outputs a, a, a set S or a description of a set S. And his guarantee is a, a, the hypothesis only answers on X and S. So if you're not in S, it's gonna abstain. And what I require now is that the rate of abstaining plus the loss, so this is the error, when I do answer positive and negative, which is only uh, when restricted to the set S, is less than epsilon. So uh, there's the sub P and sub Q here. What that means is you want, in a sense, what do you want? You wanna be able to abstain very little on P, where you did see training examples, and you wanna make sure that you don't make too many errors on Q, where you didn't necessarily see training examples. And you want both of these requirements to hold at the same time. Uh, so we just take the sum of it. And we want the sum of it to be small. Uh, so any questions on that? Is that kind of clear what, the, what I'm, I'd like uh, low, I, I, you know, ultimately I, I want low abstaining rate and low error rate. And uh, that I could get on uh, maybe on, a, on if P and Q are close to each other, but the further apart they are, you know, my chance of not abstaining goes down. At least I want to make sure that my chance of errors doesn't uh, go up. All right, so you can ask, so this is a model and this is a requirement to mean that it's a successful with respect to epsilon's parameter learning algorithm. Uh, is it reasonable? So I guess I think it is, uh, we think it is. And the reason we argue that it's reasonable is first of all, in uh, the natural sort of covariate uh, shift case where the goal is to come an hypothesis that will work for future distribution, I guess you can adapt it in retrospect. Um, so maybe you cannot just give you an H and say, hey, go, this is gonna work. But uh, as you go along, you might be improving it because you've seen more and more data that's not uh, uh, that's part of your testing distribution and, um, and not training. Did I change this incorrectly? This should be, sorry. So people understand. So in other words, I have two distribution and what I want is a low rejection on the thing that I shouldn't reject because I've seen a lot, enough ex labeled example and low error on the new distribution. Um, so that's a definition. Now, can we achieve it? And what we show is yes. Um, and uh, the theorem is the following. Is uh, first, let's look at the, at the sort of covariate shift. So when the adversary doesn't actually see my hypothesis. And what we can show here is that for every, for every Q, okay, so for every uh, testing distribution, um, it will output a hypothesis restricted to some set, so a description of a set that it's restricted to, such that with high probability, uh, the rate of abstaining and the rate of error are, is bounded uh, by order of square root of D over N. D here is the VC dimension. And uh, essentially there's a condition here, and that is if the class was packed learnable, in a realizable setting, then this is true. So pack learnable meaning that on, if you were given a distribution P and you were tested on distribution P and you could, let's say, learn with high probability and um, with low error, let's say with an um, empirical risk minimization algorithm, then you can convert that algorithm, use it in order to achieve this for every P and Q. So, um,
maybe some natural question is why do I care about pee at all? All I should care about is the future. I should have the abstaining small and the loss small. And that's sort of implied anyway uh, by this requirement. Okay, but it's sort of proportional to the distance between the training and the test. Um, let me see what time it is. I guess we have a minute. I just want to give an idea of how such a thing would work. Um, so such a thing would be, work like that. First of all, what I do, so remember, I get X's from P, which are labeled, and then some test examples. Let's call them T's. So first thing I do is I just run a, you know, an empirical risk minimization, and I get it just as usual, like PAC does, and I get a classifier H. And that's on the training data. And uh, let's say that that's uh, this blue here. And that's actually the thing that I'm going to output also. But what I am going to work with during this uh, work for during this algorithm is to come up with a set S of abstains. And uh, the way that I'll define my set is that I'm now going to look run the ERM again and uh, find a new classifier in the class of classifiers uh, with the following condition, that it's equal to my hypothesis on the training data, okay? but it disagrees as much as possible on, uh, on the remaining uh, test set. So but when I say remaining in the first iteration, it doesn't make sense. So just if we think about the first iteration, because I do this again and again, is I say, okay, I wanted to not make mistakes more than absolutely necessary on the training, but on the test, I want to be as this C, as far as possible from H. So make as a, the opposite decision. And uh, then I essentially abstain on all the test examples, uh, which, uh, which uh, where the disagreement happened. And then I do this again and again. It, so, and what is my set S of abstain? It's all the, those test T's, which I decided to abstain on because H disagreed with the C. And I keep doing this. I keep finding another classifier, which agrees on the training data, but disagrees uh, on the things that I haven't abstained yet on the hypothesis. And uh, where it disagrees, I abstain. Because obviously the hypothesis is gonna be wrong there. So I abstain. And you keep doing that. And uh, I guess one question that probably comes to mind to people in this field is, okay, I can do a ERM here because I have labeled examples, but how am I gonna do it here when I don't have labeled examples? And so here you do some kind of a boosting type thing. You come up with fake labels for the test distributions, and true labels for the train distribution because you were given them and, and you, you doctor this distribution so that you can get the result you wanted. I think that you've been extremely patient. Uh, I'm just, so I'm gonna end, I'm gonna say something about the complexity, never mind the complexity of the algorithm, the fact that we can also deal with white box and get some results. There's some extensions. There's already another work by Adam Kalai and Kanade where they, rather than, require low error plus low uh, abstain, they have like a penalty for abstaining and they try to minimize uh, the penalty. So it's a different loss function and they have a different method to do it. Uh, and their proofs are much nicer than ours. Um, and I guess, what's the conclusion? I guess the conclusion is that there are some settings which where it's better to abstain than to make a mistake. So if I'm a, an, a surgeon <laughs> in the middle of an operation or somebody prescribing medicine, and I don't know really what to do. It's better that I don't, you know, cut off an arm. Or if I, I guess, in the context of videos, and you're trying to label videos, I guess, in YouTube, if they're hate speech or pornography, you probably, if you are not sure, you probably let a second uh, judge go through the video and make a judgment. So this abstaining could be uh, an important, an important uh, a filter. And uh, I guess the thing to say, of course, is that we want to say that uh, all this is a, is a problem when you don't have labeled data on distribution Q, the distribution you're interested in in the future. Uh, so we are giving you a way out, which is to abstain. But abstaining is not enough. So obviously, you should collect more data. So that's um, kind of this last part, that you still need representation. Just the fact that you can abstain and not make mistakes is not good enough. Um, and indeed, the last thing that I was going to talk about, which I won't talk about now, was um, how do you get more data? Well, suppose you don't have data for minorities, suppose you don't have data in the target distribution you're interested in, can we uh, get better data automatically? Can we sort of uh, use source data and to map it to 
conclusions about target data, even though we sampled properly in the source data and not in the target data. And we have some new work here, again, with Michael Kim and Throka and, and Omer Reingold and Christopher Kern about this. Um, so I think I'm putting one more slide up. You know, the security, the secure MailQuest, it's not restricted to privacy, as you saw, because I didn't even talk about privacy. And it's not restricted to, to using cryptography or cryptographic tools. But maybe it is influenced by thinking as a cryptographer, is that we think adversarially. Um, and robustness and verification are some things that cryptographers have studied. It's not only restricted to privacy. But there's a lot of tasks. You know, we were looking at robustness and verification. Um, a, we were thinking about safety in the case of the robustness. Uh, a lot of people are thinking about fairness, but there are other societal values that you could think about where you could possibly formulate them mathematically and, and try to achieve something that is some sort of approximation for a legal doctrine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shafi, for this great talk. We are already a bit out of the time, so maybe just uh, uh, one or two quick questions. Yeah, so, so great talk. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, one, it's maybe more of a comment than a question, um, but uh, how does this work on abstention relate to uh, a now very ancient thing called knows what it knows learning? So <laughs> do you know, have, have you heard of this, this concept? Okay, so this is a concept that uh, basically says, all right, I want you to learn a hypothesis that is willing to say, I don't know for some small number, uh, some small number of examples. I guess that doesn't work in the distributional setting usually. Usually this is like in an online setting, you either make a prediction or you can you can abstain, uh, but you only get like a finite number of abstentions followed by being given the answer. Uh, so it might be interesting to know sort of the relationship technically there. I see, interesting. Okay, so you, every time you can get, uh... You know, you get a certain number of abstains, and then they give up on you, and they. Yeah, and the abstention at following an abstention, you get the true label. I see. Okay, um, so you learn from your mistakes somehow, or from your abstention. And what if you get an incorrect label? Do you also get the true label? Uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe so. Although I think there's there's also this setting where like you're not supposed to make any mistakes other than abstentions. Uh, I think there are both variants. So I think that I have now I know uh, what you, body of work you're, you're looking at. So I think there was a work, at least one work by Revest and uh, someone else, where they were looking at abstentions, but it was in the case of the same distribution. So they were saying, every, you know, just to say, you know, you're training, you have, you have, uh, you have. Uh, testing and uh, you're allowed to abstain because you're trying to reduce your error rate. I think the re results were mostly negative, but the point here is really to change the distribution. So where I think it makes a bit, um, to me, more sense that this comes up and that there's no chance that you're gonna learn. Uh, so it makes sense that there's nothing else to do. But I think in that case, at least in the work of reverse that, that I'm thinking about, um, it was to kind of make life easier for you so that you could do much better in your error rate. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, the work I'm referring to is not that, uh, although that also sounds relevant. Uh, this is actually in an online distribution free setting. Uh, so so uh, Michael Kearns has some work on this, probably other people too, but that's the stuff okay. I was thinking about. So. All right. And I should look at it. I, I, I assume Adam knows about it, but I should look at it. We, we have one more question by Jennifer. Jennifer, you wanna ask it? Thanks, uh, thanks for the talk. I thought it was uh, super interesting. Um, I was wondering, uh, could you comment on how your work relates or is maybe different from the idea of returning like a calibrated model? Um, Cause it seems like in some sense, maybe, you know, your, your idea is like, you can either say, you know, I know enough to classify this point or I don't know at all. And then the calibration gives you some kind of measure of, of confidence. Right, so I think the work by Adam and and uh, and Kana, Kalai and Kanade uh, talks about confidence uh, in about assigning scores. So when you say I don't know, they have some kind of a penalty, and there's a, 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 a and um, I think that they actually don't say I don't know. They they say uh, yes with certain probability, period, and that encompasses the yes, the no, and I don't know. Um, 
and then they get penalized. Uh, I think in some how far that is from the from the correct answer. A, I don't know what you mean by calibration, so so I I I, I can't answer. I mean, there are different, it's not that I haven't heard the term calibration, I didn't even use the term calibration, but there's so many definitions that I think that we have to be kind of stick to a single one in order to be able to compare. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, if, I mean, if there's any like specific one that, that you think uh, your work relates to, then I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I didn't have something like very specific in mind. Um, Okay, sounds good. And we've uh, heard a lot from Shafi now. It's all very interesting, and maybe perhaps it's time to maybe a bit too much her <laughs> and <laughs> let her take some well-deserved rest. And uh, thank you very much for coming, and thanks, Shafi, again. Thank you. Bye bye.